discovered 10,000 times on Mars. This was a revelation in 2000, cover of science, all hands, press conference. We've seen this on Earth. These eruptions temporary that produce layered rocks, we've now seen from orbit with MRO. This kind of texture, this kind of topology, these kind of chemistries, there's me, um, not on Mars, but on CERTSE, um, are the kind of things we're looking for. So, of course, right on CERTSE, we also have extremophile life environments right there at our footsteps. These are the modern records of what we're looking for on Mars, and they're elusive. They may be everywhere, or they may be almost nowhere. Here you see cyanobacteria colonizing uh, a vent of steam that goes down to the mid-ocean ridge. Um, NASA and the National Science Foundation have invested in studying these environments. They may be lurking on Mars. We don't know. Of course, this is what we'd love to find on Mars, right in uh, the region in Iceland, which most recently uh, erupted in, in the last few million years. These kind of boiling steam events. Um, we've seen chemical signatures now from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbit or hyperspectral imager of the rock deposit that would come from this kind of thing. Uh, I like to tell the story that our cameraman, when we filmed this from Discovery Channel, um, didn't quite realize the peril he was in, but um, it shows the, the nature of human exploration. So I'll finish with, um, well, that's just the ooze that we find that we would love to find on Mars. So I'll finish with a little story that I like to tell. Uh, about 50 years ago, uh, 51 years ago now, the great American modernist painter, um, someone known as Georgia O'Keeffe, no relation to our former administrator, um, uh, painted this famous picture, The Ladder to the Moon. I think it was a harbinger of an era of human exploration that went to the moon and then to the space shuttle that allowed servicing Hubble that you're going to hear about in a minute. It was a harbinger. This great picture by Georgia O'Keeffe, uh, painted in, by the inspiration of her, I guess, her, uh, her ranch in Taos, New Mexico, I think defined maybe the first and second generation of exploration of the universe. It led to Hubble. It led to the dreams of the next decade. But now I think those dreams are changing. The bigger universe and this planet are beckoning, scientifically, exploration-wise, and I think in the minds of many of, of the people that will have to actually go do it. So I maintain that going to Mars someday with humans is both scientifically compelling, but also it's compelling in its own right as an example of what we can actually do um, in the domain of, of high technology in space. So I'd like to finish then with just the thought that um, you haven't seen anything yet, sorry about me loading up my PowerPoint again, but um, just load it up again. Um, and I like to finish with this thought because, whoop, sorry about the security. Um, Mars is the fourth rock from the sun. The kids are interested. Here's my daughter in sixth grade giving a presentation about Mars to her, her uh, buddies, um, 120 kids in Howard County. But I show this because they were actually interested enough to ask for it. A bunch of random American sixth grade girls and boys wanted to hear about the universe through the eyes of Mars. That's what we're presented with today as our nation deliberates and our nations of the world how to get to Mars. The science from the Mars Exploration Program has been inspiring. It's as compelling as the Earth Observing System has done for our own planet, and it's ready to continue to deliver. So I want to just thank you all for listening, and please look forward to the Mars Science Lab and its Curiosity Rover. It's, you haven't seen anything yet, in my view. So thanks very much. Chris, I don't know if I have time for one question. I know Mario's waiting. Sure, you just have to come up to the mic if you want to ask a question. Okay, any comments, questions, thoughts? Um, otherwise, powering down. Uh, I am powering Quick down. Quick question, Jim. Yeah. Uh, what do you say to people who say that we don't need to go to the moon in order to prepare for Mars? Andy, I, the only answer I can give as one individual is, as you know and I know, Mars is 1,500. 1,500 or more or more farther from the Earth and the moon. And it took us the investment of the 60s to get humans to the moon with all those brave explorers. Um, we're still living off the legacy of the findings, the rocks and things they returned. We're even seeing the hardware now, thanks to LROC on LRO. Um, Mars is exceedingly far. We've gotten good with our team at JPL and across the world at going with robots. We have 20 years of robotic exploration to continue at Mars, including returning samples. Um, I think the moon is an ideal proving ground for some of the technologies that will make the Mars frontier accessible. Now that said, we of course could go straight to Mars. 
However, I think going through the moon as a stepping stone, or free space as a stepping stone for that matter, um, present other possibilities of learning as we go. And learning as we go is how we did Apollo. Remember, as you know, Gemini. Remember Apollo 8, risky as it was. We don't have analogies for that for Mars yet. And you know, one of the things we discovered 10 years ago in the study we did for Mr. Golden was, what are the roadblocks to getting humans to Mars? Well, human adaptation to space. We don't even understand the basics of the gravitational radiation uh, adaptation across the time scales of getting to Mars. Secondly, in-space propulsion. Where's the in-space propulsion gone for the last 25 years? I think those restartable Apollo motors were the best we ever built. That was the 60s. We don't do this frequently. And so these roadblocks, or technological impediments, heavy lift to put the masses needed to get to Mars to keep five or six women and men alive. Andy, I mean, come on. This is, this is not simple stuff. And so you know, we had a joke in the early days of the decade planning team. Um, one of our colleagues, a uh, very smart guy, said, well, you know, if we just send the people's heads, I mean, how to keep the rest of them alive being an issue, I will leave for the medical colleagues in the room. Um, so I think, Andy, the moon is a worthwhile, very worthwhile stepping stone. There's fantastic new science. It even relates to Mars. The robots have a lot to do. Sample return is critical. The, the confidence of that round trip, robotically, from Mars, or more than one, but one at least, is so essential to making that next step. I think our leaders in this country now, if we said we're doing sample return, with our partners in Europe and elsewhere, Canada, and we're going to get it done, and that will give us the confidence. I think that would change the equation. So long answer, I think we need the moon. How long we use it, how we use it, those are critical engineering questions for a lot of people a lot smarter than I am. Um, so you know, I'm bullish on the moon as the step to Mars myself. I'm one guy, you know, went to Brown with you. I don't know. Um, maybe it's a Providence view. Um, but thanks, Andy, for the question. Okay, very quickly, uh, do you think that the human mission could be done instead of the Mars sample return? How necessary is it to do the Mars sample return mission, and, and when is it planned? Well, I think a robotic Mars sample return mission, since it's been recommended by every National Academy study since 1978 that I've read, probably before that, but those as far back as I remember, um, is, is a necessary step scientifically to understanding Mars. Critical. And I think because of that, it should come before we make the investment in human missions. A, it builds the round trip engineering confidence of going and returning safely, in this case, with samples of stuff, but notwithstanding that. Um, secondly, it gives us the chance to exercise the laboratories of this planet, not just here and in Europe, but in Russia and China and everywhere else to look at those materials. 500 grams of Mars, a kilogram of Mars from a place we think might have preserved evidence or building blocks of life, or evidence of something related to it, would be phenomenal. We don't even have the time boundaries of the Mars epochs defined absolutely. We use meteorites and crater counts. This is, you know, poor person science. So I think we need that desperately. Um, that's not to say I think that human missions could not do phenomenal sample return at Mars with the eyes and minds of the people, the women and men that need to go. But I believe that a robotic program of sample return done collectively by the world community, NASA, ESA, whomever else is interested, is essential. I think we need to get started. We're already starting now with the Mars Science Lab, landing kilo, uh, a metric ton on Mars in 2012. Um, the building blocks are in place. Now we have to just go and do it. I think it will have the kind of impact in a different way than Hubble has had um, in exploring the universe. Uh, because the universe can also be explored through samples, and we know that. So. Um, is there time for one more? One more? Yes. Hi. I was just wondering, politically speaking, how would you make the argument for the kind of investment that these kind of projects and um, explorations will demand, especially as uh, you know, the push for clean energy technology and development seems to be at the forefront of, of everyone's minds? Well, first, I'm a scientist at NASA, so do not speak politically for anyone except one American. So, so you know that. I need to say that. Um, and, uh, but that said. But that said, all a question of investment. I ask my colleagues often when I speak, OK, you have children, right? Many say yes, not all. Some have dogs and cats, but whatever. Um, and I ask, well, what kind of investment do you make for their future? I have children. I care deeply about them. I mean, is it 10% of your net worth? Is it, what is it, 1%? And they say, oh, you know, it's somewhere like that. And I said, OK, so think of the investment in these kind of programs. 
exploring the Earth with the Earth Observing System, looking at the universe through Hubble, uh, looking at Mars through Mars Science 